Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz, joining you from Livestream.travel and the, our breaking news show together with uh, Dr. Peter Talo in Texas. I'm, as most of the time, in Honolulu, Hawaii. Actually, today I'm joining you from the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center in the center of Waikiki. Um, the weather is just beautiful here. It's sunny. It's a little bit warm, but uh, it's comfortable. And I just had a really good uh, tasty lunch at P.F. Chang, and I'm sitting outside P.F. Chang and w wanted to see how things are in College Station, Texas today. Well, today was really a beautiful day. The weather forecast was tremendously heavy rainstorms, but instead we had beautiful blue skies, lovely white fluffy clouds in the sky, and a temperature which almost felt like spring um, in the uh, 60s, which is about uh, 14 degrees Celsius, and with a gentle wind. So it was a beautiful spring day in the middle of the summer. And it should be normally at this time of year about 90 degrees. Instead, it was about 60, it got up to about almost maybe 70 by the end of the day. But in the morning when I walked, it was about 62 degrees. So um, springtime came just out of nowhere. It was, it was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and um, the flowers were blooming, uh, the sky was blue, it was just, a type of day you'd like to put in a box and hold it. Perfect. And College Station, I think it's kind of in the center of Texas, isn't it? Well, you know, Texas is very big. Um, College Station, <laughs> I would say, is toward the eastern part of the center. Uh, so it's a triangle. If you make a triangle with uh, Houston in the east, uh, southeast, Austin in the southwest, and Dallas in the middle of the triangle, the top of the triangle, College Station will be right in the middle of that triangle about equally inaccessible from all three major cities. So and okay. I noticed I didn't say accessible, I said equally inaccessible, um, <laughs> all three major cities. But anyway, lots has been going on here. Um, one of an interesting news article um, that I got from, um, re was reading about from I-24 News was that they're working on this um, and, and hope to launch very soon, these air taxis which are going to be really wonderful. Um, they go at uh, over 150 miles an hour. And in places, I was just corresponding with people in Mexico City, where tourism is often bottlenecked because there's so much traffic on the roads that people tourists can't get from one place to the other. But if you have air taxis that will be able to take people from one museum to another, wow, instead of spending most of your time on a highway going no place, you'll be actually able to go to see many of the events. And in the <laughs> larger places, um, the, the Airbus has a range of about 400 miles. And um, that means that you'll be able to, say in Hawaii, get from one island to the other quite easily, or a place like Brazil, which has lots of attractions, but they're all spread out across the country. Um, this would make life really a lot easier. And transportation is an integral part of tourism. And tell me what, what an air taxi is. Is that like a, something you have to go to the airport to catch it? Or it how do you do it? it? No, it'll be landing on different buildings. And um, it, it's like a drone. It'll be pilotless. It'll be scheduled. I, oh, my I God. <laughs> I don't want to be on that one on those. <laughs> yes. It'll be kind of an interesting experience, uh, to say the least. But um, it will it'll be feeling like you're in a first-class uh, seat on an airplane. Um, but it'll get you to your next destination very quickly. Obviously, it will have routes. Uh, so it's just that you're not going to drive it to wherever you want to go. It will be programmed and say, take me from, you know, say the Royal uh, yeah, yeah. Hawaiian well, Shopping awesome. Center to um, Waikiki Beach or, I don't know, you know, something. Um, well, that wouldn't be too far because no, we're well, right in front of I, it. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to think, Diamond Head, take me to Diamond Head. Okay, all right. Okay. okay. And um, so, but I think the real issue is how will that really change the face of tourism? And the bottom line is people are working on driving, uh, flying cars now. Uh, it's not going to be long. I mean, we, 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 this is not stuff that's going to take place 50 years from now. We're talking many of these things will be in operation within a year or two. And it's really going to change the face of tourism. You'll be able to do so many more things without the bottlenecks, the traffic jams that right now are just really destroying cities around the world and tourism but, is difficult. But how do, you, how do you see traffic jams in the sky above you in 
in taxis that have no drivers. I mean, would you go on it? Well, I'd probably be a little frightened the first time, but maybe I would get used to it. Um, you know, we do have, um, I, I think they're going to follow probably pass. They'll probably, I, I'm sure someone's thinking this through, but I think it's a little bit like when, you know, in, uh, say, La Paz, Bolivia, you take um, funiculars. Uh, uh, basically, it's just form of your transportation because there's so many mountains, which are really driverless, you know, but they follow a, a, a cable. And I think these types of things, these taxis will probably file some sort of cable in the air, you know, uh, so that they'll be, you, you won't be able to go every place. We'll go, it, it, it'll be set routes um, uh, that, that will take you. I, I would think that's how it's going to be in the beginning. I'm making that up on some level, but that's how I'm surmising <laughs> it, it's going to be. Um, but I'm sure, that, you know, this is going to be a really interesting type of um, situation. Mm. And I think in the world of tourism, the really important thing is, as you've noted, um, airfares are going up so much. And, um, you know, inflation is hurting the tourism industry uh, uh, now and may hurt us a lot more by the end of, um, uh, of uh, the summer, that we're going to have to come up with really creative ways for people to be able to afford to travel. Um, I know here in Texas, gas is at $4.30. Well, that's cheap. Astronomical. It's astronomically expensive for us. And... Um, you know, as, as, <laughs> I know in Hawaii it's even more expensive. It's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's now exceeded six dollars here, Peter. Yes, and it'll be even higher in California, and uh, I think California is a better parallel to Texas because Californians like Texans have to go long distances. Uh, in Hawaii, your distance is very short; you can't drive to another island. Um, right, but you can have to take a plane, and if Jet fuel, which is cheaper than car fuel, but does um, go up, the price of an airplane is going to go up. And I wonder how that would even affect an island nation or an island state like Hawaii if you can't get from one island to the other. Because yeah, and, and of course, Hawaii is a very typical example how it should not be because we don't have a ferry service. Everything is reliant on air. We had the super ferry several years ago, and this was... Uh, eliminated by, I call them nothing against people who are for the environment, but these are really environmental fanatics um, and um, pretty much supported by the only airline um, here in the States not to have this type of competition. So what it leaves us here is just airfare. And there's literally just one major airline. There are a few smaller places, uh, planes that fly sometimes and you can charter a, fl a plane if you have a lot of money. But we're really relying on just one airline, what dictates this market. So, and, and uh, yeah, a monopoly. it's a monopoly and, and see what it does for families. We have a lot of people that have families on one island and, and they live on another island. So if you take your family, you have to spend like $300 a person to fly back and forth and you have a family of four, that's $1,200. Yeah. And then it, God forbids, if you're a tourist, you have to get a rental car and you have to get a hotel on top of it. So that could become quite pricey. I actually call a lot of the people who take this type of environmental conceptualization Marie Antoinette, you know, let them eat cake, qu'ils mangent le gâteau, uh, because they're not thinking what it's like for family. They're not thinking about how people actually live. Um, and I'm for the environment, <laughs> but I'm for doing things smartly and scientifically. Now, we know, for example, a lot of the cutting back of carbon is now causing the oceans to warm. And so what's happening is we're having now, uh, we talked about climate change coming from um, uh, the lack of too much carbon in the air. It's actually the other way around. And uh, we're discovering a lot of the things that we did that we believe to be correct. It was kind of like COVID. We made a lot of mistakes with COVID. I'm not blaming anyone. We just didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made a lot of mistakes when it comes to climate change. And a lot of the stuff we did is really becoming, as we studied more, really counterproductive. And it's hurting the environment and we're hurting the earth. We're not helping the earth. Uh, yeah, and so, it's as, as we learn as we go, of course. And Yes, but and, we have to be smart enough not to be stuck in it. We have to yeah, and I think not only that, Peter, I think what is important is to have industry that claims to be environmental friendly only to generate a profit for the very same industry just 
you know, we have to be more careful and understand this. So in this case of this airline here, eliminating the ferry, that is very selfish by the airline because they don't want the ferry because one carry, ferry carries passengers from 11 aircraft. So that's yeah. not good for them, right? And then they're cheaper too. So yes, of course they wouldn't like such a thing, but environmental, how can they say a ferry is less environmental friendly than an aircraft? So sometimes you really have to think before you just go and into the environment. We had the same thing in Texas. Um, they were going to build a rapid train between Houston College Station in Dallas, and then another one from Dallas to Austin, and then a third to the Triangle, Austin to Houston, and they killed it. And the reason they killed the rapid train is they said it would upset the cows. Now, I find yeah, that, it was the whales. The whales were here. Yeah, yeah I, I find it really hard to believe. Um, <laughs> and um, I bet we could move the cows a little bit. But what we really discovered was the one of the local Texas airlines was afraid that if you had, um, excuse me, if you had um, That's trains going <laughs> rapidly between cities, you wouldn't need to take the airline. So the airline right. would make money. But of course, the train uses much less, is much more environmentally friendly. So what we did is we got rid of the environmentally friendly um, system. And instead, we replaced it with something which was less environmentally friendly. But we have happier cows. At least that's what we're told. <laughs> but I don't really think the cows are happy. <laughs> well, you got a lot of space in Texas for cows. So it's not really that crowded yeah, for the cows. Yeah. <laughs> and most cows cannot hear something which is a half a mile away. So if they yeah. just kept the cows half a mile from the tracks, it would have been fine. But that was the excuse that was used and it's not, but the real issue is it's good to protect the environment. I'm not against protecting the environment by any means at all. I am against doing stupid things or things that were told to protect the environment, but in the end, kill the environment. No, I, I fully agree with you, Peter. And uh, well, it's a, it's a crazy world. And um, But uh, the world is also coming together. And you had a good example today with Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, yeah. working together on tourism. Tell me about it. Yeah, they, they, um, of course, it's not yet totally publicly. But as you know, at the very straits of the Gulf of Elat, the Gulf of Aqaba, there are two small islands, which originally were Saudi Arabian. And... Um, then were transferred to Egypt in the 1950s, and there's an agreement, but in order to create any sort of um, of, of bridges or, or tunnels or anything else, it requires Israel's uh, agreement for Saudi Arabia to be able to do this. That's part of the treaty. And what it's doing is, is they are, the two nations are starting to come together. Today, there was a um, interview by a major Saudi Arabian uh, a journalist which was put up publicly, in which he said, look, we need to work together in tourism um, because then we become a major tourism block of, of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt. And the fact is that they're using tourism as a means to put war aside and instead put um, peace in front really is very positive. And, um, you know, there are always going to be disagreements between people. That's all human beings have disagreements. But if we can have disagreements where we talk to each other and not shoot at each other, that will be a really major victory. And of course, the other side of that is the tourism agreement. The um, head diplomat of Turkey is in Israel today. And they're talking about developing new tourism between Turkey and Israel. So again, that's the Eastern Mediterranean. And if they can get Turkey, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, um, it, Egypt, all on the same page. Well, wow, you have everything. You got great food. You got great hotels. You got great history. You got religious sites. They really would become. They could turn themselves into the world's powerhouse, at least for the Western world. Yeah, and if you look at Turkey, for example, Turkey with Turkish Airlines has the largest network of any airline in the world it flies to the most countries of any airline in the world and by the way peter israel is one of them there has been significant uh, traffic between israel and turkey for many years thanks to mostly turkish airlines because turkish yes. airlines has been combining this and you can do the world so there are sometimes uh, tourism powerhouses and turkey definitely today is a tourism powerhouse you may 
problems. Think about Turkish and politics in different ways, but in tourism, it's a powerhouse. And I think Istanbul Airport is the world's largest airport, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, the new airport, as far as I know, it is. <clears throat> and um, there's no other airline in the world where you can fly nonstop to so many places. Like, look at gateways just in, into the United States alone. Uh, there are more than almost any foreign carrier from Europe. And, uh, but they also fly to destinations like Cozumel, Cancun, Mexico City, all nonstop to Cuba. Um, to, and now I understand they're starting service to Barbados. They're thinking about Jamaica, um, Canada, and to how many destinations. That's all from Turkey. I, sometimes I wonder where this traffic comes from. But it's not only benefiting Turkey. The idea is really to benefit other countries when they have to go through Turkey. And what Turkish Airlines is doing right, they promote stopovers in Istanbul. So that helps tourism for guests that may not even want to go to Istanbul. They may want to go to Armenia, to Israel, to Egypt, or other places, but they're but stopping in Turkey for a few days. days. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I remember Icelandic Airlines used to do that when exactly. I was in college. Yeah. Um, they still do it, Peter. They still they do, do it. it. But the cheapest yes. way for a college student in the 1960s <clears throat> to get to Europe from the United States was through Reykjavik. And um, I remember it was all the, the uh, flights were all college students. Um, the airline served nothing more than codfish and brandy. They, I guess they figured they had anybody drunk. It was, <laughs> <hold on>, but, <laughs> I, it was hard to get a glass of water, but brandy flew, flowed like, like water. And, but you had to land in Reykjavik. It was much cheaper. And the plane didn't leave Reykjavik until they sold enough Icelandic sweaters. So yes, it, I remember I bought one of those and they were good. I had them for like decades. I still after have that. <laughs> and you landed in the middle of the night in Luxembourg. But I don't know how many people ended up shopping at the Reykjavik airport because if you didn't buy enough stuff, the plane didn't leave. And it was a yeah, no, strategy on the part of Atlantic Airlines. Yeah, and when that started, and the reason they flew into Luxembourg, what a really unknown, insignificant place for when it comes to major cities in Europe, because Luxembourg said, yes, we do this, and there was a special agreement, like Germany hated Icelandic because they had minimum airfares to the US and uh, Iceland Air was able to undercut it. And what they did, for example, I lived in Germany at the time, they had bus service like every couple hours from Dusseldorf and from Cologne and from other cities to take you to Luxembourg airport to yes. catch an Icelandic flight. Yes, I, I used to go to Paris and I flew into Luxembourg and there was a bus every hour from Luxembourg right. to Paris. So it was much better. It was half price for me to fly to Luxembourg, especially as a college student, and take the um, take the bus than it was for me to um, fly directly to Paris. And uh, it's, but you saved enough for two nights in a hotel. Yeah, and it was not only Icelandic Air. There was a Caribbean Air or Air Caribbean with uh, flights to Barbados. And then from Barbados, you could go to other places. So it was a good, the begin of the concept you see today in Istanbul, or in Dubai, uh, pretty much also with Emirates Airlines. And uh, these are strategically really well positioned regions in the world where these type of, uh, uh, this type of business could be brilliant also for the future. Yeah, I think it's going to be because of the fact that um, uh, inflation is so bad right now around the world and prices are going up so much, people are going to start looking for bargains. And if you are able to turn your country or your airport or your airline into a way to save people money, they're going to go to look, to, especially if you give them decent service and good customer service with a smile, they're going to look to come to you. Yeah, and, and, and of course, the world um, is changing. On the other hand, uh, nonstop flights are more and more promoted. If you look at now the new nonstop flight between Sydney and London, what was announced, I don't know when it's supposed to start and uh, using smaller aircrafts to connect cities nonstop. So there's a pool also against these stopovers, but I think it, it, it has advantages for different type of clientels, perhaps. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be interesting to see what type of clientels we have in a year or two, and how many people in the middle class are now looking for bargain airlines, because a lot of people who were traveling um, could afford maybe a business class or a nice trip once a year, maybe say, you know, I have to pay for school for my children. 
I have to pay for much food costs. If you go to the supermarket are through the roof. Uh, gas prices are very expensive. And all of a sudden people are gonna be looking for ways to save money. And, so and ironically, Peter, you know, when it comes to the example, we've been talking about Turkish Airlines or Emirates, these are top notch airlines, yes. but with really low prices. So yes. how did they do this? Well, I think one is that they probably, and I don't know that, I, I, I'm, I'm making this up, but one, I wonder if they're unionized or not unionized. No, they're not unionized. Okay, as far the, as one, yeah. the one, they're able to probably uh, have less cost per employee. Secondly, because you don't have union regulations, the employees may have um, be able to put more into it. I remember Southwest Airlines, the flight attendants also cleaned the plane. Now, um, <laughs> I, I realize that, you know, that would never go in a unionized airline, but the bottom line is they all work together and they were able to keep the price low. And then Southwest Airlines was able to um, offer prices much reduced to those of other airlines in the United States because one, they didn't have the overhead. Two, my guess is they may get a, a, um, a gift from their own country as far as landing fees. And that would also, landing fees are very expensive for airlines. And they're used like a secondary airlines. If you look at Ryanair, for example, in Europe, many times they land at airports no one else flies to. They're right. probably the same distance to the cities, but they're just airports. Like in London, you have Luton, you have several other airports. In, in Germany, you have uh, an airport also called Düsseldorf, where it's almost 100 kilometers away, no one knows, in the middle of nowhere. And that's how they keep the cost low. And you know what? Those are much better airports because you don't have all, when you get a Heathrow in London, it's the world's most hated airport. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, you go to JFK in New York, it's the same thing. You're just, it's, or, or LAX in Los Angeles. Those are awful airports. They're, they're pushed. You're, there's lots of crowds. It's hard to figure things out. You running from one part to the other. I would always prefer a smaller airport where somebody smiles at you. Um, yes. I always tell my friends, you know, in Miami airport specializes in rudeness. And uh, <laughs> I think they fire you if you smile. <laughs> well, you can come here to my part of the world and fly out of Molokai or something. Everyone knows everyone. So yeah, people I still like smile that. at some airports. I like the problem is I can't get from one island to the next. Yeah. So we're All back right. to where we began. But I think, you know, what we're getting from this is the world of tourism is changing quite a lot. Um, lots is going on. Um, I think we are going to have to come to learn to live with the war in Ukraine. It's not going to be done quickly. It's, uh, uh, will it spread to other parts of Europe? Nobody knows that. It's still very much potential. Of course, you probably saw the um, predictions of, um, of George Soros, who says that he thinks that um, this is going to, we're going to have a World War III and that. Uh, oh, that's not <laughs> Yeah, and uh, most of Europe will be wiped out. Um, now, this is going on at Davos Airport, you know, right now going on in Switzerland. And um, many people are talking about this as part of the Great Reset. And the fact is, uh, will, will they wipe out the middle class and will we become a two class society with a very small number of wealthy people and the rest of the people being serfs? If that's true, and I hope it isn't, and I pray it's not, basically, that's the end of tourism. Right. So it will be an uh, interesting world. But what's going on in Davos now would be really interesting to see. I would love to be a fly on the wall to hear what's going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, uh, it's a, it's a fast-changing world, I guess. And I see and you're everything. changing the locations in, in Hawaii. I'm, I'm walking. I'm taking all of you around the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center a little bit. Which is I'm a actually, lovely shopping center, by the way. It's, it's a nice uh, shopping center, yes. And... Uh, it's uh, busy again here, so and the shops are open again. What is also good? It looks like uh, business is coming back. Good. Well, then I want to wish you a wonderful afternoon, and I wish you a good evening from Texas. Stay safe, and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, and thank you very much, Peter. Bye -bye. And if you wanted to watch this again, uh, just uh, stay tuned. We're going to repeat it usually every two hours for 24 hours. And then you can always go to uh, breakingnewsshow.com and listen to this broadcast and many others. And of course, if you want to have the complete selection, go to our YouTube channel. Just click on the YouTube link on any of our websites or go to youtube.com 
travel uh, news. And uh, Peter, thank you very much. And uh, Otzi, you have a good night and aloha from Hawaii. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Located just 20 minutes north of Kathmandu is one of the hidden gems of Nepal, the temple at Buddha Nilkanta. Come with us and discover this magical place. Legend has it that a farmer was digging in his field one day in the 6th century, and he struck a rock. The rock began to bleed. As the farmer dug, he uncovered what would become the largest single stone statue in Nepal. Carved out of a single piece of black basalt was the statue of the reclining god Vishnu. Lord Vishnu is one of the three most important gods to Hindu. Thank you.